Good morning, family. Good morning and welcome this morning. I'm delighted to see you. We're going to continue having folks coming in. I know that. But you are noticing here in front of me and kind of spread out here in the center, a lot of students and adults in purple T-shirts. These T-shirts are from their weekend, Disciple Now 2020 where close to 500 students from nine different churches in the area, Michael may tell us a little more on that, but shared together in a wonderful weekend where the theme of that weekend was rain, awakening a new generation to King Jesus. And they're going to share a little bit about that weekend, and you'll hear and see some of what has taken place. So we're finishing Disciple Now. Uh, students, this is the final event of Disciple Now in your home church. Now let me also say real quick, in the back of your seat somewhere, you will find a brochure, and it is an emergency preparation plan. And I want you to hear this. We're not anticipating an emergency today. It's not there for today, but it is for you to know that our FIT team, our First Impressions team, has continued to do training and go into training, and we are now a certified church in a nationwide program known as ALICE, and that is for safety and active shooter preparation, emergency preparation. Uh, it is because we take seriously, very seriously, uh, the protection of the people when they come on to this campus. And I want you to know that, and I appreciate our FIT team and Corey Edelman heading that up. Well, I know we have guests with us today, and we're delighted that you're here. What we'd like to ask you to do, if you'll take your worship guide, if you're not a member of our church, and would you please fill out the card that is found on the inside of that? It would just be a real honor if we would get a record of you being with us today. We want to say thank you for coming in a very personal way, and I just want to say thank you for being here right now. Family, let's get our hearts ready. It's the end and the concluding service of Disciple Now of Misfits Weekend 2020. Let's stand together. And as we prepare our hearts, let's remind ourselves, why are we here? I exist to glorify God and work with Him as he builds his kingdom. Give someone a good warm welcome, and now let's give God our very, very best. So glad to see everyone this morning. Excited to lead you in worship. There's a grace when the heart is on. Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and the reckoning I know I will never be alone Come on! There is another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the wall Holding back the seas And should I ever be reminded Of how I've been set free There is a cross 
sins of the world His blood breaks the chains And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Every knee will bow before Him Psalms 96, verses 1 through 6. Uh, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wondrous works among all peoples. For the Lord is great and is highly praised. He is feared above all gods. Fear, or for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Will you please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Lord, I just want to um, thank uh, you for providing all the people who uh, gave up their weekends to uh, help uh, us learn more about you, Lord, um, including the, the leaders um, and then the host homes especially for giving up their houses for us. And... Um, I just want to thank you for calling the people who invited their friends to come this weekend. I know sometimes it's a challenging task to do that, but uh, that just shows that they want people to learn about you, and they're trying to spread your love and affection for all. And um, just thank you for letting us come together and uh, learn more about you this weekend. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Good morning. All right, so I hope that you had as good as a weekend as I did. Um, like Bill said, 
Um, we had nine churches from uh, Mansfield, Arlington, Grand Prairie, and Duncanville. Um, and if in the atrium, I'd like to say this too. Um, if you thought you saw two of me, uh, I do. My twin brother is here, um, so you are not you're not going crazy. I promise. Um, this last this past weekend, as most of you already know, this Misfits or Denial weekend, we had 64 students, 14 college students, seven host homes, uh, and many other people who brought food, snacks, or help behind the scenes. Uh, and without who, a weekend like this is possible. Um, last night, one of the last songs we we sung was called uh, "Set a Fire," and there's a line in there that says, "There's no place I'd rather be than than here in your love." And in that moment, I I had a couple of thoughts. One of them was like, "Man, I have the greatest job in the world." Um, <clears throat> and some of you might ask, you know, why do we have a weekend where we we pump in a ton of food, little to no sleep? and have some crazy people who allow some teenagers to come stay in their home. The reason is simply this, so they can come face to face with a king who loves them and understands what they have done for their lives. This past weekend, like, like Bill said, the theme was rain, awakening a young generation to King Jesus. Um, the very first night, uh, Dr. Ross, our speaker, um, he, he took out a little Jesus figurine from his pocket. And so basically the whole weekend was about are you worshiping the little Jesus in your pocket that you only take out when you want to or are you, or are you worshiping the king who sits on the throne? And I'd like to show you this picture. Um, the fact is, is if, we're, if we're real honest with ourselves, I think, I think a lot more people in here than just our students worship that little Jesus in their pocket. So the challenge this morning, we got a couple more songs. The challenge this morning is to simply to worship the king who sits on the throne for forever. Um, and so at this time, we'd like to have a couple students share about their weekend. Hi, guys. My name is Trinity. So this weekend, I've been reflecting on this past semester and my relationship with God. Um, I've been working on leadership, like in the youth group, in school, and just any situations that God puts me in. Overall, I really just want to grow in my confidence with Christ. A verse that God put on my heart this weekend was Romans 12, 12, which says, Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. Hi, my name is Carson Brooks, and uh, this, this weekend was a, a really special one. For now, for a couple years now, I've really felt God nagging on me to uh, do something in the ministry, but this weekend, um, I really felt something to go 100% on him now. Just uh, watching all the youth ministers' faces when the kids came up to accept Christ, it just uh, it was a real special moment. And I just want to be a man who can help along and guide them uh, for more special moments like that and it's just uh, it was just a real good weekend and uh, yep Let's stand and worship together. Thank you, kids, for sharing. And I know there are others that God did something great in your life. And we'll be praying for you. Let's sing this wonderful song of praise. Sing with me. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Come on. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down. See 
in praise.
Consuming fire in victory, you reign. We triumph in your name, Jesus, the great commander. You conquer death forever in victory, you reign. We triumph in your name, our God, a mighty warrior. You're a consuming fire in victory, you reign. We triumph in your name. Consuming fire in victory, you reign. We triumph in your name, Jesus, the great commander. You conquer death forever in victory, you reign. We triumph in your name, young God, a mighty warrior. You're a consuming fire. give you praise lord we give you thanks god for this weekend for our youth i pray father now as our pastor comes father speak through him and lord may we grow stronger for you father in jesus name we pray amen you may be seated amen jesus does reign and students this weekend disciple now 2020 is coming to a close but this morning we are going to wrap up really focusing in on that which is the ultimate aim and the purpose when you recognize Jesus as king. You see, for life to make sense, you must have a 
purpose for living. Out in the world, everybody is looking for a real sense of purpose. Why am I here? But until, until you come face to face and settle the question, who is ruler and king of your life? who will have first place in your life, you will not find that ultimate purpose for which God created you. You see, there are many people out in this world that they would say, I'm a master of my own destiny. I'm the ruler of my own universe. And you know what? When people give themselves to anything but Jesus Christ, last night... Dr. Richard Ross challenged the students that in the world, you could put many other things first, possessions, prominence, or fame. You could put your job, you could put your family, and even relationships or your personal life. But anything put in front of your relationship to God through faith in Jesus Christ is no God at all. And I thought of one of my favorite scenes in any movie, and movies aren't a place where I get a lot of theology, but this was one of them. I'll set it up. It's in the first Avenger movie, the Marvel Heroes One of them is Thor, and he has a brother named Loki. Loki is always causing problems. And there's another one character, Hulk. Well, here is a confrontation between Hulk and Loki. If you didn't hear that whole thing, the Hulk, after he smashes Loki down, his final statement to Loki's word, I am a god, Hulk's response is, puny god. Anything, anyone, anything you put in priority over Jesus Christ in your life is a puny God because it is no God at all. The very fact is in Colossians 1, 17, the Bible says he, Jesus, he is before all things. In him, all things are are held together. He is the first of all creation. In verse 18, the head of the body, the church, the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Paul then tells us that it pleased, it pleased God, for in him, to reconcile all things to himself by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We just looked back in December at the coming of Jesus into this world, reminding ourselves that God the Son stepped out of the glory of heaven, wrapped himself up in human flesh, came to live as a man on earth, never denying and taking away his full deity, but he took on our full humanity. He lived a perfect life that you and I could not live. And then when the Bible says he came to reconcile all things to himself by making peace through his blood, we look ahead to Easter and we see the cross. And on that cross, Jesus Christ died for your sin and mine. Buried in a tomb, rose to life the third day. He today is King of kings and Lord of lords. 
purpose in life will never be found until you settle who is Lord and King of my life. But once you settle that, once you come to understand who Jesus is and you give him your life, then what does God want for you? Well, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, and Paul says by inspiration of God, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, what he's done for you, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Worship is a lifestyle. It encompasses everything that you do. Worship doesn't end when we close this morning and leave to go to our homes or wherever you end up going. Worship is how you will conduct yourself on Monday in the classroom, how you will interact with your coworkers throughout the week. It is what you do in the day in your daily activities. Worship is giving myself back to God. And what God wants me to do is then to grow and reflect Him and to become in my life more like Jesus. Students, as we close out this D now reign, I want to challenge you this morning that one of the purposes God has for you and for all of us is that we would fulfill our purpose through life-changing discipleship. Discipleship is simply becoming a disciplined follower of Jesus Christ. In Romans 12, 2, Paul lays out three things that we must do to be a disciplined follower of Jesus in order to become more like him. First of all, to have life-changing discipleship, you must make a conscious decision to forsake the world's ways. Paul writes and he says to us by inspiration, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. That word conformed literally means be pressed into a mold. The pattern of the world is the likeness or the Form that the world would like to press you into, to be fashioned after it, to copy its behavior, or to follow its customs. How many of you kids, when you grew up, your parents had and gave you one of those Play-Doh press machines that you could put Play-Doh in? I even had those and gave them to our kids. You take Play-Doh, and it's pliable. And you put Play-Doh into this little plastic machine, and then you put a form on the front where the Play-Doh would be coming out, and you take the handle and you press down. And when you press down, the Play-Doh then goes through the machine, it comes into the form, and it comes out in the form that you desire. Well, that's a picture of what Paul is saying, don't do that. The world wants to take you as a pliable individual, and the world wants to take you and press it into its mold. The world system is totally upside down from the purposes and the plans of God. The world system values personality first. The world system is me first. God's kingdom is Jesus first. The world system values power. God's kingdom values service. The world system values prominence and fame. God's kingdom values humility. The world system values possessions. What do you have in your hands? God's kingdom values generosity and stewardship. What have you given away? The world system values pleasure. God's kingdom values sacrifice. In John 17, Jesus said, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. He hates you. Jesus said, they, my disciples, 
my followers, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. In Galatians 1, the Bible tells us that Jesus gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present age according to the will of our God and Father. Now, young people, if you are rescued, if you are rescued from something, then why in the world would you want to go back to where you had been in bondage? When you conform to the world, when you allow the world to press you into its mold, you are allowing yourself to be conformed on the outside to something that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not positionally with God on the inside. See, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. You see, you are now a different person. Some of you this weekend, you made a decision to take that step and invite Jesus Christ to come into your life. You received his gift of eternal life and forgiveness. You are a new person. But now that you have been saved by faith through Jesus, now you have to make a choice. You see, disciples have to be made. Christians, believers, are born by God's grace. But to be a disciple, you have to make a choice to follow him right now. Jesus one time had some people come to him, and they wanted to follow him. And they, though, came and one said, Lord, I'll follow you, but first I need to go bury my father. Another one came and said, Lord, I'm going to follow you, but first I need to go back and say goodbye to my family. Neither of those two things inherently on their own are bad, and in fact, both of them are things that God would encourage ultimately if the father was right on the verge of dying and he had a family responsibility. God says to us to honor our father and mother. That would be a responsibility of saying goodbye to the family if they were immediately going. Jesus was sensitive to that. But Jesus understood what they were saying was, you're calling me now. I want to follow you later. I like what the comfort is right now. I don't want to make a decision today. And Jesus said to them in Luke chapter 9, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I once read of a town that had a tornado came through it. And the tornado came through, and the only thing the tornado did was it tore up one of the churches in the town. But it was the way the paper described it, and this is how it read. We are pleased to announce that the only thing that blew away was a so-and-so church. But the tor tornado did no real damage to the town. And I've thought about First Baptist Church. If somehow tomorrow we as a people were not here, if we were taken away, would this city even miss and realize that we were gone? Do we make a difference in this world? Are we living lives that, by their nature, are countercultural? That they display the kind of love that spouses should have one for another, the kind of family units that are learning to grow and to put Jesus first? Do we make a difference in how we minister to people in this community? If we weren't here, would the world even notice? Yeah, students, on the back of your shirt, it's Misfits. Misfits 2020. Well, God calls us under King Jesus 
He puts us in a long line of wonderful heroes of the faith who are also misfits in their day. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 20, 38, the Bible tells us of these heroes of God. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in caves and holes in the ground. But they were the heroes of the faith. You know, one way you can think about faith is take the letters, and we use that in our evangelism ministry, but faith can be used and looked at this way, forsaking all, I trust him. Will you be a hero of the faith? If you want to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you must say, I will not be conformed to the world. I want to be different. I forsake the world's ways. Second, to be a disciple, you must not only forsake the world's ways, but you must feed on God's Word. Romans 12, 2, the Bible says, now be transformed. Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word transform is a word we get our English word metamorphosis from. It is to be changed radically from the inside out. Transformation is an inward act that God does that then makes the outward look like Jesus. It's the very same process of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly or a tadpole becoming a frog. And God says, this is what I'm doing in you. When you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, you acknowledge him as your Lord, your king. You have forsaken the ways of the world. Now I begin to feed on God's word. Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them by the truth. That is, make them holy. Set them apart. Your word is truth. Psalm 119, King David wrote and he said, Oh, how sweet are your words to my taste. They're sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, and so I hate every wrong path. What God would have you to do, students, is for you to understand that the world wants to squeeze you into its mold. But what does the world's philosophy have? There was a survey done of many of the producers that make the TV shows and the movies that we see, and it was startling their mindsets. 93% said they seldom, or if ever, would attend a church. 97% believed in abortion on demand. 80% believe homosexuality is natural and perfectly acceptable conduct. 51% believe adultery was okay. God's word is countercultural to the mind of the world. You must feed on God's word more than you feed and allow the world to press you in. In Colossians 3.16, the Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in psalms and all wisdom and sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Sing it with gratitude in your heart. When you gather, you've done it well today because the Bible tells us in Hebrews that we are not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let's encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You've done good being in this place. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you need to make a commitment that as you were here this week, you will be here in this place next week unless you are out of town or sick and cannot get out of bed, that you will be in God's house to let the word of God dwell in you and to worship him with glory as you sing out in your heart. But also to feed on God's word, I want to challenge you to be in a small group. Would everybody take a look at this card that you have in your worship guide? This card is a card that encourages something that we're starting real soon. 
We have Sunday school classes that meet on Sunday morning, but a few months ago, we began to look and recognize, and last year we had a few home groups that began, but we asked Chad Hampton. Chad, would you mind raising your hand for me? You heard Chad preach for me back in September. Chad and Brittany, Brittany who grew up in our church family, Chad and Brittany were led back here after Chad had some very wonderful, productive time in full-time gospel ministry, but the Lord redirected them back. But as we watch Chad and Brittany being involved, we've asked Chad, and the church affirmed this, to ask Chad to be an associate with us, in addition to his teaching with students at the Fine Arts Academy, to guide us and facilitate the development and the energy of home groups. If you are not in a Sunday school class, here is an opportunity for you. I'd like you to fill out this card. Mark a place. Where would you like to be? Chad will begin to compile and will help facilitate some groups in a home that will meet about an hour, hour and a half, one night a week, and they will give you then some things that will facilitate we want you to be a part, and he'll share with that a kickoff in a few weeks, I believe, Chad, on that. But take this card, fill this out, please turn it in, and we'll start compiling those. What you need is not only the large group worship time, but every one of you need a smaller community where you can gather together in a smaller group for not only fellowship and encouragement, for also deeper walk to discuss the Word of God together. So feed on God's Word. And then finally, if you're going to be a disciple, not only must you forsake the world's ways, you must commit yourself, I'm going to feed on God's Word, but I commit today, I'm going to follow God's will. In Romans 12, Paul closes and he says, when you do these things, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Jesus said to his disciples, as you sent me, Father, into the world, I've sent them into the world. He is sending you out to do his will, to live his purpose, to glorify God and to work with him as he builds his kingdom. Jesus said in John 4, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And students, God is sending you. Adults, God is sending you. And Jesus then said to disciples one day, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Let him forsake the world. Let him take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever must save his life, he'll lose it. But whoever loses his life for me, he will save it. One of my favorite hymns, it's a very simple hymn, is a hymn entitled, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. But I didn't know the background of that hymn until this past week. And some reason it came to my mind. And I said, I'm curious about the story. Who wrote that? This is what I found out. In the mid-19th century, the mid-1800s, you may know that there had been mission effort to the nation of India from William Carey at the beginning of the 1800s. That did not have a whole lot of fruit initially, but over the years, gradually, more people went into India. A group of American Baptist missionaries went in the mid-century of the 19th century, went up into an eastern province in India known as Assam, a northeastern province that in the middle of that century had a number of tribes that were more like indigenous tribes that also were very primitive and headhunters. You can imagine that they weren't always well, very received, but one American missionary went into a tribe known as the Garo tribe. 
And in that tribe, after some time, there was a man who accepted Jesus, then his wife accepted Jesus, and his children, students, accepted Jesus. His change in his life was so noticeable and so apparent, others began to be interested in this gospel. The city, the town elder, the town chief, got extremely jealous And out of the anger at what was happening as a threat to him, he grabbed the family, brought them to the center of the town, and as a story told by an evangelist, Indian evangelist named P.P. Job, in a book, Why, God, Why, he tells his story. The city chief brought this man into the center with his wife and his children. And he told the man... You will renounce this Jesus or we will kill your children. In that moment, moved by the Holy Spirit, the man began to simply compose the words and he actually sang a song. And these were the first words recorded. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The chief immediately ordered the archers to shoot those two children. And as the children lay on the ground dying, the chief said, now, renounce Jesus. The man looked, and he said with a second reply, Though no one joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. Though no one joins me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Immediately, The chief ordered his wife to be shot. And then the chief looked at this man. He said, for the last time, I give you one more opportunity. You deny your faith and you can live. And the man responded with these words. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Immediately, the chief ordered his archers to shoot that man, and all four of the family died that day. But Job tells this story, and he said, but immediately, a miracle took place. Because immediately following that, the chief of the town, he all of a sudden, it struck him. Why would this man, his wife and his children, die for a man who lived in a faraway continent almost 2,000 years ago? There must be something. He doesn't serve a puny God. I want what he had. And the chief, Job said, turned to the people. And he said, I too belong to Jesus. And with that, people followed his lead. And an entire region began to be transformed by the power of God. I want to ask you this morning, students, you've had a weekend. I know you're a little tired, but you've had a weekend being confronted with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who do you serve? Mom and Dad, you are in this place today. The question is, who do you serve? I'm going to give an invitation. This morning, if you have not 
given your heart to this one who loved you, died for you, buried, rose again, lives today. He is the king. I want to invite you to come and give him your life. If you have followed him with your life, but you have not followed him in baptism to identify with him publicly, I wanted to tell you this morning, if you can't stand up for Jesus in a room like this where everybody's cheering you on, There's no way you will stand up for him when the world comes against you out there. And I want to invite you to come and give a commitment of your life to Christ and follow him in baptism. Some of you are believers. You've been baptized. You come to this family. You listen to the word, but you haven't made a commitment to Christ to be a part of a local church home. This morning is your time. No turning back. No turning back. Will you bow your head? And I hope as you bow your head, would you say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Lord, I pray this morning that there be students who will take now what they have heard and committed on the weekend, but they will stand up for Jesus. I pray for a mom and dad who have watched their kids, and they need to take the lead today to stand up for Jesus. I know there are decisions in this place, decisions that are made to give their lives to Christ, to follow you in identification through baptism. There are decisions to make this church family their home. Today, there are other things that we need to do. God, I pray right now that we will decide to follow Jesus not turn back and come to the altar of the Lord in Jesus' name. Will you stand very quietly to your feet as we begin this invitation? Michael is here at the front, students. Our staff is here to meet with you right now. Somebody, kids, this is your time, final time of the weekend. You made a decision. You need to take a step. King Jesus, he's calling you right now. Step out and come right now. Come on. Some of you made a decision last night. Come on right now. Come on. Come. Somebody will follow you. Come on. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I want to know, some of you kids, God's speaking to your heart. Have you followed Jesus? Have you stood up for him? Have you let him be your king? Somebody, God's calling you to take that step. To say, I'm ready. I'm going to follow Jesus. One has come. God's calling some of you. Mom, Dad, Jesus is calling. I have decided I'm going to do God's will. Come. Somebody else, God's calling you to come. He's calling. Thank you so much, and I'm thrilled that I'll get to share these decisions in a moment. If you have a decision that you thought, I, I'm just about to make it, come on during this invitation time as we have it. 
keep coming, you can come and I'll meet you here. But right now, Clay, would you take us to the Lord in prayer? God has something special this morning for us. Yes, sir. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for our time to gather here. Father, I thank you for this weekend and, and all the great teaching and the, the music and all the good times we have. Father, I just ask that as we go from this place that uh, we allow you to reign in all our hearts and all our actions and everything we do, Father, not just these youth but every one of us in this room, Father. I thank you for all you do for us. Please take these uh, tithes, these offerings, and use them to your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
All right. What a good, good word. You got to see a little bit, those of us who weren't a part of the whole weekend that the Lord did. And uh, so, kids, uh, you did well. And now go home and go to, go to bed. Go get a, get a nap. And uh, all of you host homes, let's say thank you to our host homes. Wow. And Michael, well done. Well done in that. Well, we have a few that are coming this morning, and uh, I am thrilled with both. Jean, first of all, come up here and join me. I want you to meet Jean Persons. Jean has been attending our family for a while. Jean and his wife, Kathy, mm -hmm. were attending together. A few weeks back, and I, gosh, I lose track of my time, but Jean's wife, right before Christmas, uh, she was, had had hip surgery, and while she was still in rehab, uh, one day she had a major heart attack. And they were planning on joining together, but his wife, Kathy, passed away before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Well, Gene, after all of that, we walked through that together. But Gene uh, is coming because he's been a part of a sister church in a, in a neighboring city, but he lives here in Grand Prairie, and this has become his home. And so Gene is coming today by the promise of his letter from a sister Baptist church in our area. And if you welcome Gene, would you say amen? amen. And God bless you. And Gerald, come and be Gene's, uh, come and be Gene's encourager here, all right? Gerald, as you guys are going to uh, share together. Max, come here, buddy. This is Max Bertellis. And uh, Max, his family has come and been a part with Raymond and Carolina and uh, Max, this weekend, made your decision mm -hmm. that, yes, I understand uh, who God is, and I understand who Jesus is, but this weekend, and last, was it last night? Mm -hmm. yes. Last night, Max invited Jesus Amen. to have reign in his life, <laughs> and Max is coming. Max is coming this morning, and he's going to follow Christ in baptism. Mom and Dad, come up here. Sister, come on up here, and I want... Let's see, what grade are you in, Max? Sixth grade. I want a couple of my sixth grade guys come and be his encourager, all right? All right, that's, enough. That, that's good, boys. Come on down. All right, y'all surround Max behind him. Come get behind Max here and uh, be his encourager. Max, that's exciting. God's got something really good for you in, in store. That's pretty good. Family, we're thrilled to have y'all. Let's stand together. And family, join hands with the person next to you. Uh, go out this afternoon. Tonight, let me just say, if you can, come on back. At 6 o'clock, we're going to have our quarterly uh, church conference. It won't take really very long, but we do have some things tonight I want to deal with with committees and other things. But if you can make it back, come on. But have a great afternoon, Bill. Joel. Oh, uh, stop. I'm sorry. Thank you. Right. Let's get him out here. Yeah, Stephen. Stephen, where are you? Yeah. Thank you, family. Let me just tell you, Stephen Falk has been our percussionist, our drummer for the last three and a half years. He drives down from Denton. And, uh, but he just got a new job that actually pays the bills. We don't pay many bills. And that job's going to keep him uh, from being able to do it. His wife, Melissa, and is here today. This is his last Sunday with us. We'll have adjustment in uh, some of that. Stephen, thank you. Let's tell him thank you. And now, Stephen, with that, we're delighted that, and we're always going to be a part of this family, Joel. Now, take us out, and let's go home in the Lord. All right.